My name is Jackie Yoakum. I'm the um, Education and Events Coordinator for the People Woods Cooperative. I know many of you are members, and if you're not, we're glad you're here. Um, uh, the Hickle Woods Cooperative provides sustainable forestry and um, management and education services for its members um, of the Hickle Watershed and beyond. You don't have to be just in the Hickle Watershed to be a member of the Woods Cooperative. Um, we, this event is made possible by a Ralph E. Newsom um, grant, Hickle Reforestation Grant. That's how we're able to provide this um, program at no cost to you. Um, and tonight we welcome Phil Pelletieri, is that right? Very good. He is an expert on ticks, which clearly is important to all of you. So, there you go. All right. All right. Well, my, my claim to fame really isn't ticks as much as, uh, for 36 years I ran the diagnostic lab for the Department of Entomology. And got to deal with things that people bring in the door, and I've told people many times that probably the most intriguing story of my career is deer ticks and lion disease. Uh, because it all kind of happened um, during my career and it was something that really was quite unexpected. Because as a student you learn about all these tropical diseases that are spread by mosquitoes and other things and you just don't expect things to happen in your backyard. Now, I'm pretty much going to concentrate on tick biology, tick control, personal protection, I'll mention the diseases as I go through, but I'm not a doctor, so you know the human side of the disease I really can't comment on, um, other than you know, I, the things that I understand as far as, as personal treatments and whatnot, um, it's best to see you know, medical help on that. So hopefully what I talk about today um, doesn't give you nightmares. <laughs> um, so ticks um, are really quite fascinating animals. They, they um, yes, are most closely related to mites, they're not true insects. And one tick's not so bad, but herds of ticks um, are really quite intriguing. And I notice that our color is a little off, but we'll be okay here. We have, right now, three common ticks that we have to pay some attention to, although there are at least 10 other ones that you can run into if you really get serious about looking into. These are ticks that potentially will bite people. What we all call the wood tick here is technically the American dog tick to an entomologist. So you, you get confusion at times with that. There's something called a winter tick that I'll mention in passing. It's a very curious tick that really, if you're a deer hunter, you might run into it. That's not something that we typically find in people. What we all call the deer tick is technically called the black-legged tick. And there was a lot of confusion because one time we thought we had two different kinds of ticks. Now we understand there's only one kind. And then a new one to talk about, which is a Missouri tick that's decided that Wisconsin's a nice place to live, called the Lone Star Tick. And I'll mention that one, which is really quite an interesting one. Yeah. Now, most ticks take two years to go through the life cycle. And what's so intriguing about them biologically is they will only feed three times during that three years. Not more, not less. They have to feed three times to, to attain adulthood. Um, if they don't feed three times, they'll probably will die from, uh, from exhaustion, really, or, or the failure to, to go through. Um, so they spend a whole lot of time sitting around patiently waiting for the next meal to come by. And you have to admire that anything can be that efficient and that patient. Now, telling the difference between the boys and the girls um, is interesting and not as bad as you think. Um, ticks have a hard shield on their back. And in the case of the males, it covers the whole back. And the male really has a somewhat limited food need. The female, on the other hand, has a much smaller shield on her back. And then the rest of her body is like a balloon. And so when you find a very large, you know, big bean-sized tick that's been on your dog, that's a female. And what she's going to do is utilize the blood that she has gotten from the host and convert the protein in the blood to eggs. And so, here we have kind of the, the um, rogues gallery. This is a wood tick, a lone star tick. I'll show you more of these as we go along. This is our deer tick, an adult female, and this is a deer tick, the immature stage that we call the nymph. Now this is a 
fat tick. This tick has been on an animal for about five or six days. It's swollen up with blood, and then it drops off, and then again it starts to process. And so um, you notice you don't even see the red anymore of the blood as it starts to get digested. They usually have this dark grayish cast. And here's just a close-up. But you can still see the shield. Now this shield is very important for identifying ticks. That's one of the reasons I'm paying so much attention to it. You see here. And after processing that blood, um, the female will lay upwards of 2,000 eggs. She does that once in her life and it kills her. So there's no way of, of going through additional uh, reproductions. And when they hatch, <coughs> and typically most ticks eggs hatch in the spring, they're a very tiny creature that we call a larva. Uh, and this is, we have a whole different term for larvae when we talk insects. But the way you can tell a larval tick, it only has six legs, where all other stages of ticks have eight. Now, this is more than just an, an academic question of it being a larvae, because I can guarantee you that larvae do not carry diseases. They have not fed yet, so they have not had the opportunity to pick up diseases and then transfer it. So that's one of the interesting parts about the larvae. They're rather small. This is a pinhead. Uh, you know, so the very small period in a, in, in a printed paper would be give you an idea. So when they hatch, the larvae will crawl up to grass or other areas and wait for an animal to come by. And larvae have a preference for small animals, in particular rodents. Uh, mice, uh, potentially birds, chipmunks, and the like. If the larvae is successful enough, it will feed for three or four days get enough blood, it drops off, it has to process that blood, it has to mold its skin to transform to the life stage. So this takes a, a, often a number of weeks. Um, the next life stage is the nymphal stage. It now has eight legs like a tick is supposed to have. It again has to sit wherever it was dropped off, wait for something to come by. Ticks have a limited ability to crawl through a host, but most of the time they're sitting waiting for something to come by. In the case of the nymphs, depends on the kind of tick. With deer ticks, nymphs will feed on people. With wood ticks, you don't see it very often. But, you get into larger animals, again, they're lucky enough to get on an animal and feed for a few days, drop off, then they transform into the adult stage, and then the adult stage, particularly of most of our ticks here, seem to concentrate on larger mammals, the dogs and cats and, and people type. So, this idea of questing or waking. Um, ticks are, of anything they're sensitive to, it seems to be moisture levels. So, the one thing I've seen in my career that has really knocked the tick population down is severe drought. I mean, if you get one of those stinker droughts where we're talking about, you know, six weeks of no rain and all the crops are failing in the field, you will see a response in the tick populations for the next couple of years coming after. But that's about it. Now, they're really interesting. They don't have eyes. In fact, as I'll show you a close-up of one later, they don't even have a head. What they sense, though, is carbon dioxide and heat. But there's a little more to it than that. I remember reading a very interesting study done back in the 40s where they would find that ticks would concentrate next to game trails, you know, deer trails out in the woods and whatnot. And they're wondering how they were doing that because, you know, the deer isn't around very often. So they did the experiment by taking basically a popsicle stick and rubbing it on a dog and putting it out, and then they had a popsicle stick they didn't put on the dog, and there was something left behind in that popsicle stick that the ticks could, could sense. So they would be attracted to that. Uh, so there, there's more than just the carbon dioxide, but if you ever see a tick sitting on a branch or, or a bush somewhere, and you blow on it, watch what happens. They start waving their arms around and whatnot, because they get all excited thinking, my next meal is coming by. So here's a questing tick. They're very flat. This happens in a male wood tick. And they sit there patiently. Now, if it's real windy, honestly, they tend to go down into the litter. They don't like it if it's real windy. If it's too hot, they'll go down. If it's real wet, they'll go down. So there is a little bit of a coming up and down given what the weather conditions are going on. Uh, but most of the time, they have to sit there and wait. Interesting enough, um, my colleague Susan Haskowitz, who's our medical entomologist in the department, had her students do a study um, two years ago where she made them get up at midnight and go out in the woods and look for ticks. And not surprising, 
they found the ticks were more active at midnight than they were at noon. But if you think about feeding on rodents, when would the rodents be more active? It's at night, and so the ticks do respond to that. So we are here we have a friendly little female wood tick crawling on Phil's arm. Uh, this is what we're all kind of used to seeing. Now, tick season. Um, it depends on what kind of tick in particular. With wood ticks, because it's the adults that are primarily what are feeding on us and our pets, it seems to be kind of a spring and early summer issue. Usually when you get to about the 1st of August, the number of wood ticks starts to drop. I won't say you don't find them, but they're really quite rare. With deer ticks, or what we call black-legged tick, anytime there is no snow on the ground, the ticks can be questing. And so I, I've had ticks come to the laboratory from Wisconsin, Spooner, Wisconsin, in January, when we had a January thaw, and we did, you know, you nice south exposure and things start to warm up. They wake up and they'll look for something to come by and if it cools down or like we just had the snow, all they do is like turn the light off. They'll sit until things warm up again and then they're up and moving. So the American dog tick, just to go in a little bit more detail, um, or again, what we call the wood tick. Um, you are more likely to find this one in your backyard than any of the other ticks I talk about. I have seen them in downtown Madison walking around the square. You know, and they're associated with squirrels and all kinds of animals that can be around. And so this one is potentially uh, an urban tick, if you want to think of it that way. And as I said, it's interesting to see that primarily they're the spring until you get into July, and then those adult ticks either have found something to feed on or they have died from, from failure of getting something to feed on. And here again is the male and female, male on the right, female on the left. I want you to pay attention to these white markings. So those are really quite important when you're trying to identify ticks. Here again, I have a female. This is the shield on her back, the plate. And you notice it? Different individuals can have different amounts of marking. I kind of explain it's like you have a, a nail polish brush, and you, you know, you're kind of painting each one of them. Some gets a little more, and some gets They all have that whitish marking on it. And here's just a close-up, as you can see. And this, that, that won't scrape off. I mean, it's not like a wax. It is. It is, is a pigment that's impregnated into the, uh, um, into the sputum. Here is a fed uh, female tick. Again, she's swollen, but I still got that plate with the marking on it. And, you know, people tell me every year in the lab, I would get calls from people who are out camping, out cut wood, whatever, and talk about how bad the ticks are. And it really, you come to the conclusion after a while, the ticks are bad somewhere, everywhere in Wisconsin and every year. I mean, it, it, there are variables like the rodents. This was a particular interesting case because this is one of the biggest concentrations I've seen. This was a gentleman's cabin up in Door County. So he sent me this picture, and then he sent me this picture, and those are all ticks. So the first question is, why does anybody go to Door County? <laughs> but more interesting is what I figures going on here. When I look at the way this is constructed, I wonder how many mouse nests and chipmunks and other things he's got living underneath. And because of that, that's where all the breeding's going on. And then these ticks are just crawling up from there. Now, the interesting thing about wood ticks, or what we, American dog tick, they are the main vector of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So we've got the tick here, but people don't get sick in Wisconsin. Interesting enough, Rocky Mountain fever, that the hot spots are North Carolina in the Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri area. Not so much Rocky Mountain as you know, the name implies. Um, so we've only had one case here under a you know, four-year study. Um, and even when you see some of these, when we get one case in Wisconsin, you've got to ask them, were they visiting their cousins down in, in Oklahoma? And we just don't seem to have the disease here. So the good thing is wood ticks don't make us sick. Now, there's a closely related tick called the winter tick. Now, every other tick we talk about, I told you, has to feed three times. So we call that a three-host tick. These guys are one-host tick. When they get on an animal, they never leave. They molt their skin, transform and the like. And that's why we don't see them on people. Where we tend to see them is on moose and, in some cases, deer. And so if you ever hear any hear of anybody that's out deer hunting, and they say the deer was just covered with ticks. I mean, unbelievable numbers. Those are typically winter ticks. So as the deer's going along, every ticket picks up, 
crawls on there, they stay on there, they keep feeding, they mate, they do other things until they're finally fully fed, and then they fall off. Um, more of a northern Wisconsin, and honestly, this is uh, the moose populations up in, in parts of Minnesota have really been going under some big uh, population declines, and they've been looking at this tick as a possible cause. But when you hear the story, you wonder if the tick's spreading something more than that. We just haven't quite figured it out. So winter ticks, you, you can find, um, but not so much for a people thing. As I said, it's something you'd see on deer. And here's just another picture of a uh, very high population. OK. Um, the new tick on the block is called the Lone Star Tick. Um, and it's really quite easy to identify because the name Lone Star refers to this white spot on the back. Now, when I do public radio, and I was telling Jackie this, one of my favorite things to tell people about how the world is working lately is the governor moved us to Missouri 10 years ago and didn't tell us. <laughs> because one of the things that I've witnessed in my career are all these southern animals that are moving northward with a lack of cold winters compared to when I was a kid. And, it's, and this is a classic example. Most people that were running the Lone Star Ticks grew up in Missouri. And I would see one or two of these ticks a year come in the lab. And it usually we figured well, they were hitchhiking on a bird. The bird flew up to Wisconsin. The tick fell off. And somebody found the tick. But there was no evidence of them breeding. Not anymore. In the last 10 years in particular, here's just a close-up again of that sputum and that white spot that we used to identify. Now, this spot, unfortunately, is only seen in the adult. But the normal range came up just about the southern part of Wisconsin. But really, to be honest, it was central Illinois is what we figured. Now, we're pretty sure any place south of the Dells, we can run into it. And I was really intrigued to see not this past winter, but the winter, winter previous, which really was very cold and very snowy and whatnot, if that would knock the ticks down. In the spring, we found at least four sites where we found still breeding populations, and there's, there's probably more going on there. It's, it's not the easiest thing to find because their numbers are quite low. Now, as I said, probably the last five years for sure we've got records of it. And there are a couple diseases that they transmit, but that is not as important as this unique trait that has been found out that certain individuals that get bit by Lone Star ticks develop an allergy to red meat. I mean, to, to the point they can't eat it. And very intriguing, if you want to look this up on the internet, part of the story is we didn't learn that directly. It was, a, it was a trial for a cancer drug where certain individuals had this allergy and they started to try to find out what they had in common and it traced back to the tick. And then they've worked up the science of it since then. So not everybody, and it's not just one bite. It probably takes multiple bites to happen. But once you become allergic, uh, it's not sure that you'll ever not become allergic to it. It's a very interesting interaction. And similar things have been seen in other parts of the world with similar ticks. It's just the first time this has been seen in the United States. This is what people call seed ticks down there. And the interesting thing, very often when the female dumps her eggs, you get such a concentration of larvae. And if you're the poor, unfortunate person that decides to have a picnic next to that, you'll talk to people that will pick up 80 to 100 ticks on one leg. You know, they're little tiny ticks, little seed ticks. Uh, feeding on them. And so that's what they're talking about is this amblyoma. But the big player here is this one. What we all call the deer tick, as I said, but technically is called the black-legged tick. Now a couple things I want you to look at real quick. The other ticks had kind of a base brown chestnut color to them. The abdomen of the female, the deer tick, is a bright orangish red. I mean, it, 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 in you know, once you start looking for that, that pops out. The other thing is this plate behind the head, this sputum, doesn't have any markings on it at all. It is just almost a jet black as the legs are. The only white you see here is from the light from my microscope. So if I'm looking for a tick, that's what I ask people. Is it, can you see that little plate behind the head? It doesn't have any markings on it. If it doesn't, then I get very suspicious that we've got a deer tick. They are about two-thirds the size of a wood tick, so they're really not that much. I mean, there's a lot of people talk about how, how they're too small to see. Well, some of the immature stages are quite small, as I'll show you. Uh, another part of it, and I'll show you some more close-ups of there, the business end of the tick is much more pronounced. They have a bigger thing that they stick into you, which is one of the reasons they're a little bit harder to dislodge, and I'll show you some other things. Now, here is one that has partially fed, and the color changes in the abdomen. 
Why is this important? If there's a tick walking on you and it has not fed on you, it cannot make you sick. So sometimes when we know we have a deer tick, the second question, was it there long enough to make you sick, which is about a 48-hour period of time. And under the microscope, we can get a general idea by looking how the body is starting to fill from feeding. So next to each other, here's a female deer tick. Here is a female wood tick. You see, the size isn't a whole lot different, but that sputum plate, and then to some degree, if they're unfed, the color uh, is, is what I use as a field care <coughs> the yellow part. Now, this is a engorged female, so she's well fed, but I can still see that plate. Quite pronounced. Here's another one quite well fed. She's starting to digest the blood a little bit more. She's getting a grayish cast. Now this is more technical than you want to be, but the other character that we use to identify deer ticks, we flip them over, and you see this little horseshoe here? That's not found on wood ticks. This horseshoe is only found in deer ticks and its related species. So that's another character that's used in the field. Here is an unfed and a fed female next to either. This one is not probably totally fed. Uh, she isn't quite distended enough. So, one of the, there's about four really things I want to make sure everybody remembers, and this is the important one with deer ticks. If there's no snow on the ground, they are active. So, tick season technically, you know, it started about three weeks ago. It went on hold for a couple days. Again, there's enough open ground now. 45 degrees is about a critical thing. Real windy in 45, as I said, they don't seem to be quite as active. Um, but. And it will not stop until we get into December uh, and we get snow. And really what it is, the factor more than anything else is that uh, metabolically, ticks are like insects, they're cold-blooded. They can't move when it's 40 degrees. That's the problem. I mean, their body just isn't, you know, but the warmer it is, the faster everything works. Now, real interesting, the first deer tick was found up in Spooner in 1969 by a student that was doing a study about the parasites of mice. And he published a paper on it because the only other place he found that tick is in Texas. So that's a very interesting thing. So the question is, where they come from? For a while there, I used my spaceship theory. You know, because it really was quite curious. But if you sit back and look at the history of the last, you know, few hundred thousand years, there were no ticks or no deer in this state when we were covered with glaciers. Okay? So even if they were here before, they got wiped out. Things melt off. Somehow the ticks have to get up here. So they can hitchhike on birds. Migratory birds are a great way for ticks to go big distances in a short period of time. But in order for things to work, they needed a couple things. You needed a male and a female to be in the same area at the same time. Plus, what seems to be a very important factor is you needed some pretty high deer densities to support the ticks. We know from some studies done in Connecticut where we have removed the deer completely from islands, that in a period of a couple of years, the deer tick populations crash. So we know that deer are an important component. But the practicality of this is that people think, well, we can reduce the deer herd to a point that they won't affect the ticks. It will not happen. We can't. It just is it's not physically possible. So there's a very interesting interrelationship. That's also, I think, the story for many people. You know, I, grew up in Madison, you know, you hear people of my age, maybe a little bit later or older than I, talk about, you know, when somebody used to see a deer by spring green, they, they put it in a paper, <laughs> yeah. you know, and now it's like rabbits. I mean, you can go and watch 150 in a field, and the next field's got 120 and, and whatnot. And so there is an important component, I think, for all these tick populations that the deer have, have helped fuel um, their help, whereas the same thing. They talked about, you never saw ticks here when, you know, eight years ago when I was a kid. Well, we didn't have the deer to support. So it's pretty much the same life cycle going on here. Uh, we find that the larvae are active in the middle of the summer. The adult deer ticks are active from the 15th of October until the snow. And then they again wake up in the spring and are active in the spring until, yeah, boy, usually by about the, the first of June or so, I start to see their numbers going down. So that's the adult ticks. But the nymphal stage, is active from the time it warms up well into the summer. Why this is important, we know from when people get sick, 
that it's the nymphs that are most likely spreading it to humans, more likely than the adults. And I think what the factor is, the nymphs, as I'm going to show you, are smaller and are easily overlooked. The adults you're more likely to find and pull off before they have a chance for a, a disease to be transmitted. So even though the adults have more percentages, higher percentage of diseases, they're not a factor. So life cycle goes from egg to the six-legged larvae that feeds on small animals. This larvae is clean. But when the larvae is fed on an infected mouse or chipmunk, it now becomes infected. If it feeds on something that's susceptible, it can transmit the disease. If not, it's going to feed for a second time. So what you find is adults have twice the amount of disease potential than the nymphs because they've fed twice rather than once. That really makes a lot of sense. So here's a larvae. Here's a larvae on Phil's arm. It's very hard to find larvae on people because I think our skin is too thick. And I didn't do this on purpose. Um, honestly, I was, was working out in the woods and whatnot. And I looked down and although I got a lot of molds, there was one that I hadn't seen before. And when I put a little magnification, it had legs. And so I just thought, oh, that's curious. And I went digging around and pulled it out. It was a larval tick, larval deer tick. The nymph is a bit bigger. This, again, though, is the one that is most e easily overlooked. Um, I equate it to about the size of a ballpoint pen. Um, this one, honestly, I can tell because of the way the abdomen looks that it's been feeding for a while because it's, it's, the abdomen's getting a little distended. The color has changed a little bit. So this is the stage that's active in the summer that can get on your person, feed for two or three days, and you never have any idea. You know, and then drops off, and then two weeks later, potentially gets sick. And here again, just close up, it has four pairs of legs, that's all identified. It still has that dark black scutum or plate. And here again, I can see this, this part of the abdomen is just starting to get a little pillowy, a little you know, ballooning. Um, from, from feeding on body fluids. So, even though the tick season's any time there is no snow on the ground, the highest risk to people is the middle of summer when the nymphs are most active, and there's less of a degree in the fall and the spring when the adults are active. And as I said, I think this is much a factor is the nymphs are more easily overlooked. Now, the male deer tick in the adult stage is a non-issue to you because they won't feed on it. Their mouth parts are not capable of feeding. What they are used for is sperm transfer. So they have a very bizarre way of mating. And so um, the male ticks have a plate, as I told you, all along their black. And what they will do is crawl on an animal, and they only find a female when she is on an animal. So the mating of this tick goes on on animal, in the deer and other wildlife that's going on out there. Um, which you would think it's, it probably makes more sense mating there than trying to find a, a mate out in the middle of the woods, you know, where you're crawling around. And it's... So here we have a nymph and an adult. This is a penny just to give you a size. So the male is about the size of, of, a, of the date on a penny, uh, <coughs> just a bit smaller. So um, now in the immature stages, it doesn't matter because they do feed. But the adult one is not a problem. So, Let's talk about the business end of a tick. Um, they don't have a head, like most animals you associate with. They have this feeding structure. And this feeding structure has two almost antennae-like, we call them palps. But think of them like small little antennae. They look like fingers. But the feeding end of a tick is best described as your thumb. We call it the hypostome. And it does have multiple sections to it. This is a close-up of the hypostome of a deer tick. And the first thing I want you to pay attention to is look at those teeth on it. You ever wonder why those things, those are barbed like a fish hook. And so when they put it into a host and you pull against it, to add insult to injury, they glue that devil into you. And so, so often why people have difficulty, whether it's on your person or on a dog removing it, is it's like a sliver that is glued in with barbed hooks on it. And so it's very likely if the tick's been feeding for quite a period of time and you pull on it, you will break the hypostome off. And here's a close up underneath the microscope. Honestly, we can identify the species of tick by the pattern of these little barbs. 
as I mentioned, there's a bunch of ticks. There is a related species of the deer tick that we find in woodchucks. There's one that we find on squirrels, the one that we find on rabbits. And the only way we can easily tell them apart is to look at the banding pattern. But those won't bite people, so we don't have to pay attention to them here. So as I said, what the tick will do when it gets on a place and it finds a place it wants to feed, it first of all has to cut a hole in, then it has to insert the hypostome, and then it secretes this cement-like material. Now this is a deer tick with a very long hypostome, this great big cemented area. This is a wood tick. The wood tick has a much shorter hypostome and not near as many barks. So wood ticks are easier to pull off your person or your dog, among other things. One of the reasons people don't get sick for the first 24 to really 48 hours of feeding is they're not feeding. What the tick is doing is setting up its housekeeping and digging this hole into you, getting the hypostome set in there, and then getting it glued in. Once all that's done, then it starts to feed. So it's not this quick hit and run type of feeding that you get uh, when you associate with, with something like a mosquito. And so you get a reaction. This one is very personal to me because it's right there. <laughs> Um, this tick, I've been out bow hunting, um, and it would probably be on my person for three days. And I found it um, and pulled it off as best I could. Um, and this reaction here is not a disease reaction. This is my body reacting to its feeding. I mean, it's pumping saliva in there, and my body took offense to that. And so that little ring like thing is very small. I mean, you know, maybe about smaller than the size of a dime. Um, and that may take some time to heal. But that itself is not a problem. Here's another person's reaction where you see this blooded area, the tick, tick is still present. Um, that um, is, is not that unusual, especially with deer ticks. Um, I, the way I describe it, it's like somebody had a sharp pencil really poked you really good. I mean, that's the kind of reaction I expect from these things. Now, people have all kinds of home remedies to get rid of ticks. Um, and a study down in Ohio State basically tells us None of this helps. So I've had people tell me, well, you've got to turn them to the left. Other people say, we've got to turn them to the right. Well, they're not built like a screw. Um, oils, if you leave an oil on a tick long enough, it will probably suffocate. Um, but then you've got a dead tick on it. That doesn't do you any good. Um, everything tells us is you grab as close to the base as you can in a slow, steady pull. Not a quick jerk um, is probably the most likely way. Now, if the hypostone breaks off, the only problem you've got is like having a sliver. It could get infected. Nothing worse. The hypostome doesn't make you sick. If the tick's removed, what you don't want to do is grab the back of the tick and squeeze. Because what you're doing then is injecting all of its body fluids into your person. And in the case of Lyme disease, the stuff's in its stomach. And until it migrates up into the salivary canals and gets pushed out, it doesn't get into you. So, you know, rather than using like a hypodermic needle to put it in, you pull from there. Now for dogs, they even have these special little tick keys. Um, I know Sandy Sawchuk talks about these quite a bit. Um, she's got one on her keychain, and you basically just slip it over in a gorge tick and pull, and it tightens around the base, and then you can just pop it. So you can get a grasp of it. They do also sell special tweezers and sporting goods stores and, and the like for people who spend a lot of time outdoors to make it a little easier uh, to grab and pull. So. One of the interesting things as we've studied this tick, and if you spend any time outdoors, Jack and I were talking about this, I told you you can find wood ticks anywhere. It doesn't surprise me because they're associated with squirrels and the like, but if I've got to go looking for deer ticks, I have to go in special places in the woods to find them. And for those of you on property, if you've spent any time looking, the way I explained it, we were doing a study um, in, in, uh, uh, down by Arena, um, and when we were on the top of the bluff, you know, oak bluff, we couldn't find any ticks. When we were down on the side of the bluff, there was a little creek coming through, so it was kind of a wetlands and whatnot, there was no ticks. But the north side, that was an oak hickory mix with a bunch of thick raspberry, was loaded with them. And so the way I describe it to people is if you hunt grouse, the exact place you'd crawl in to get the grouse to come out or send your dog into is where the, the, you find deer ticks. You don't find them in in prairies, you don't find them in open fields. It's these isolated little areas, but if you find the right spot, they can be very, very fit. So it's interesting is that, you know, um, in Christmas tree plantations, we don't see them. 
part of it may be because it's rather dry. The other thing is most Christmas tree plantations have more ants running around than crazy, and I wonder if the ants are picking up the ticks and feeding on them. That would have a part of it. If I go to an old pine forest, you know, red pine, white pine forest, you walk in there, what is there? Bunch of trees, things are so shaded, nothing's grown underneath it, there's no ticks. You can't find a tick there. But some studies that my colleagues have been doing down in Spring Green, where we've got this red pine decline and the red pines are dying, as soon as the trees start to die, all of a sudden you get a bunch of sunlight, you get a bunch of understory and raspberries, and all of a sudden the ticks are thick as heck. So there's a relationship there. So as I said, um, you can start to think about these places that you're most likely to run into them. You don't see them in Vilas Park. Um, we do now see them. They just got to the Arboretum in Madison, which has been a very fascinating thing to watch because we got deer and turkeys and everything running around. A very diverse habitat in there, but until about the last five years, no deer ticks. And they were in there pretty good, and then the drought kind of knocked them back, and so I'm not quite sure what the status is. But as I said, uh, people who are so worried about them showing up everywhere is really not a, a good indication of the habitat that they live in. Okay, so the disease issues. It turns out that the deer tick or black legged tick is the big stinker. It spreads. Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, auriculosis, babesiosis, which is a malaria-like disease, Poisson virus, <coughs> um, and probably at least a couple, three other things that we really don't even have names for yet. Um, as I told you, some of these other ticks, the American or the wood tick does spread Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The Lone Star tick does also spread auriculosis, but not Lyme disease. There is a very interesting association between deer ticks and Lyme disease. And in other parts of the world, there is Lyme disease. It's always the first cousins of the deer tick that are responsible. There's a sheep tick in Europe that spreads a Lyme-like disease there. Um, there's another tick in Australia that uh, is, 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 has a similar type of story. And for all these diseases, the issue is, as I told you, the tick starts its life clean, but the tick acquires the disease typically from rodents. But once the disease feeds on it and picks up the bacteria, now it's in its body for its life. And every time it feeds, the next two times, if it was a larvae, or one more time if it's a nymph, it has the opportunity to go. So, 0% of the larvae, whatever it is in the, the nymphs, it will be twice that potential in the adults. So we pick on white-footed mice as the primary vectors, uh, or, or, or reservoirs is what we call it, of the disease. But chipmunks have been found to be culprits here in shrews, which you know, are mouse-like creatures. In other animals, it doesn't seem to be an issue. In deer in particular, although the deer are important for the ticks to breed, deer are not important for Lyme disease. We, we can't see the deer showing any symptoms of Lyme disease. They don't carry enough spirochetes in their blood to become infective. Plus, once the adult's fed, it's not going to feed again, so you don't get transmission there. So it's all about the rodents. And um, this is what's seeming to happen every three to four years, it seems, we're discovering a new disease that shows up. There's one that showed up in Eau Claire. In fact, I don't even think it's officially got a name yet. It was described about two years ago. That turns out to be another rodent disease that this ticket, the tick is the bridge. That's what I think. And that's a, the best concept I think you can think of. Now, Lyme disease itself was only discovered because the high incidence of juvenile arthritis in Lyme, Connecticut. And when the doctors looked into it, they walked it back and found out that indeed it wasn't typical juvenile arthritis. It was a, a complication from this Lyme disease uh, that they came up with. Um, and um, even though it was described in 75, you know, it took a long time to, to write the story. Same thing in Wisconsin. I told you that we had 69 was our first tick. Um, there's evidence of a physician having Lyme disease in the 70s, but we didn't know what Lyme disease was. I mean, it had all the symptoms, you know, and so now you look back in the records, you can find out that people were dealing with it. It's been an issue in Europe for over 100 years. Lyme disease in Europe, though, behaves differently. People don't get the arthritis. It's a complication, but people get um, skin sores over time associated with the disease. So it's kind of interesting. So. The two hot spots are Wisconsin and now spilling into parts of, of uh, Iowa and uh, um, Illinois and Minnesota. And the East Coast has really taken off from Connecticut. 
And now it's down in New Jersey, getting into Virginia, taking over Pennsylvania, moving all the way up to Maine. Although interesting enough, the first, quote, deer tick that we have was caught um, in the islands off Connecticut in the 1940s. And if we go back to the museum specimens and look, we can find the presence of Lyme disease in the late 40s. So they were already starting to pick it up from the rodents. So this was probably always cycling through in the rodents, but it never had a way to get into people. What this tick has done has become the issue. So in Wisconsin, there has been a strong prevalence to the western side of the state, although what I witnessed in my career is, you know, every year we'd add a county or two, and now we have deer ticks recorded in every county of the state. They are still less frequent on the east side and more frequent on the west side, and I think that has much to do with habitat. Even in Dane County, it's interesting to watch. Western edge of the county, which tends to be more wooded, more bluffy, the like, lots of ticks. You get from Madison East, where it basically is straight agricultural land with these little woodlots. You can't find a tick. It doesn't have the right habitat, among other things. Although we do have them doing very well in the Kettle Brain down in Waukesha now and the like. So the number of cases, um, this is the CDC records for, and you, you notice it was almost a doubling going on here. And this is an alarming number, but to be honest, we now know this is a gross underestimation of what's going on. Because um, about two years ago, the CDC has decided that we're only reporting 10% of what's going on. And part of this reason is that if officially to be recorded as the disease, you've got an official piece of paper, there's got to be an official blood test, all these other things that you send in. Most people will go to a physician who have symptoms, they'll give you antibiotic, and they won't go through the paper. You know, treat the patient, and so this is how they've come up with this. Now, one of the other things that have changed is when I was first starting and, and we were testing the ticks, only 15% of the ticks were carrying the disease. Now the average in the state is up to 40%. And we have one study site in, in the Kettle Moraine and Waukesha, it's 80%. Wow. So that's four out of five adult ticks are, are carrying the disease. And now as we've looked into it, we've got other things going on. Anaplasmosis in particular, um, babesiosis. Um, so here is a report on where people have reported the disease. Now, what you have to factor into this is more people live in Dane County. This doesn't say where they picked it up. This just says this is where they live. Uh, so the same thing, pretty high incidence in Milwaukee, considering there's not many ticks here, but those people were typically traveling. But where we know is the hot spots, um, as I said, is the western, west central part of the state in particular. So we're averaging somewhere between 20 to 44 cases per 100,000 people per year in the state. In New Hampshire, it's up to 100. So they've got twice the activity that we do. Now, I'll warn you that one of the things that I have seen is when you read stories about what's going on in New England, it isn't quite the same as here. Because the people in New England seem to be able to find their, their yards pretty easy. But when you analyze why that is, is that some of these, what we call yards, is somebody that bought 20 acres in the woods and built a beautiful house there, and they're living in the woods, but they call it their yard. Well, guess what? There's ticks there. That's not so surprising. So Lyme disease has this characteristic bullseye rash, but it only shows up 60% of the time. Sometimes it can go almost systemic, so you can have rashes all over. Sometimes it, it is as innocent as a heat rash, so the rash itself is not diagnostic. Um, people who get the disease often will report just, you know, severe fatigue, body aches and the like, uh, in, in, in many cases, you know, can't even get out of bed. That's the initial stage of the disease, but there is um, complications that set in later that include everything from um, facial paralysis and neuromuscular problems uh, that come on. Um, there's a facial paralysis that really is, is, is quite typical. Uh, and then potentially chronic arthritis uh, or other complications going on, which seem to be more of an autoimmune response where your body's fighting back to what's happened. And you, you, you hear about people who have had these tragic cases that went months and years without being diagnosed, you know, and then when they finally figure it out, it's hard to put things back together. It really is. But the important issue is that it takes the tick probably 48 hours of being on your person feeding to start transmitting any of these diseases. 
And again, the reason is because they're really not feeding those that, that first day or so. They're just kind of get things ready to start feeding. So infectivity levels, as I said, nymphs are always half as much as the adults. We watch these things start to, to uh, escalate. Um, it's very interesting to, to, to study the interactions. There's been numerous papers on this. There's a relationship between years of heavy oak nut production, acorn production, and Lyme disease. But there's a delay. It's a one-year delay. And what they have found is heavy nut years mean more mice, more mice mean more ticks, and it goes right along. Another very interesting study that um, when coyotes move in an area, you get more Lyme disease. And what they correlate, this is related between coyotes and fox. Fox do a much better job of controlling the mice. But when the coyotes move in, they kick the fox out. And they, although they feed on mice, they feed on other things, rabbits and the like. And so there's a, a, a change there in the ecology. And that ultimately affects how many rodents are there, how much Lyme disease in the rodents, and how much the ticks get. So the more we study this, the more complicated, really, it gets, unfortunately. So, if you get a tick bite, the big issue is if you were out today working in the woods and you come home and you find ticks on your person, you've probably got nothing to worry about because you have removed them before they've got any opportunity. It's when you know you can trace it back to three or four days that you start to get more nervous. Now, one of the things that CDC has come up with, and the reason I was showing you the figures of the infectivity levels, is historically, doctors have been told, do not treat patients unless they have symptoms. You know, we'll run the blood test. If you're sick, we're going to give you antibiotics. But in states where the infectivity level is above 20%, I'm telling you, or 40%, if you know it's a deer tick, you know it was on your person for two days, um, you should talk to your physician because what they're recommending is one day's dose of, of antibiotic. And they find that that's 100% effective. So they're treating you before you show the disease. But it's also when everything is isolated and very in one spot, much easier to get to so to give it time it spreads through your body. So that's what that relationship is. Mm -hmm. So they just give you one, 200 milligrams of oxycycline. Okay, anoplasmosis is another disease, very similar muscle aches and the like, but rarely a rash. What caused problems when this disease started showing is people were sicker than a dog. They run the normal tests for Lyme disease. They were negative. They weren't treating them and not realizing that it's another tick-borne disease that could be stopped with the same antibiotic. This isn't happening as much anymore because anoplasmosis now is common enough that doctors are running the blood work for it. And so now we can, we can test for that. Um, so specialized blood work, again, treated quite readily. Uh, this shows, again, you know, that interesting relationship. The same hot spots as Lyme disease, so are we surprised at the same hot spots where the ticks are? So that's why we know that the black leg or deer tick is responsible for this. And last solid figures I could get, 572 confirmed cases in Wisconsin in 2011. So it's not a small number, and it continues to grow. And we again have seen this continue to spread throughout the state from those hot spots uh, in the west central uh, and northwest part of the state. Um, now the symptoms typically show up a week, as mentioned, is three weeks later. The interesting thing about anoplasmosis is older people seem to be more susceptible. And so this is just an age graph. Uh, so it may be that younger people are getting infected and they're just not developing the disease uh, is one of the possibilities. And there's a third one called human auriculosis. Um, this was published on, on some people that were getting sick up in the superior area in, in parts of the UP. And they found out it again was a new disease uh, spread by the deer tick. Uh, it's a rickettsia disease, which is related to Rocky Mountain spotted fever. <clears throat> but again, it is treated quite readily with antibiotics. Um, there's a relationship of middle summer acquiring the disease, which fits again the nymphal stage of the deer tick. So that is suspected to be the main culprit here. And the combination of these diseases, and they're, they're, they're somewhat related. Again, we're, we're dealing with well over 1,000 cases a year. So, um, and as I said, this is the new one that was discovered up in, in the Eau Claire area. Uh, it has not really got a, a name yet. There's another one. You know, there's a couple of these diseases we know that the, 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 the mice are giving to the people, and people aren't getting sick from what we can tell. But we know people are getting exposed to it because if you do the blood tests, they're showing the antibodies. 
So um, there's a or I mean a, um, a Lyme disease-like thing uh, uh, called um, Muris is the species, but I can't remember the genus right off. Point that we think most people don't react to, but you know one of the things when you study populations, groups of people is you know 90% of us could not be susceptible, 10% could. And so there, this is kind of the worrier out there is that some people are picking up things that don't, don't affect most of us, but only affecting a few. And it's, it's not an easy medical dilemma of trying to sort through and diagnose some of these, these, these particular problems. Okay, so let's talk about what you can do to prevent this stuff from happening. Clothing. The more clothing, the better. Because what you want to do is prevent the tick from having access to any part of your person. So tucking your, your, your socks on the outside of your pants is a good idea. You know, the kids scream at me, you know, when the Boy Scouts go out and whatnot, you tell them to wear long pants and whatnot in the woods and it's in the summer, they don't want to. Well, it's for their best interest. And honestly, um, light color clothing isn't so much, you know, the ticks can't see. They don't care what color clothes you wear, um, but they're easier to see the ticks um, um, than they are on dark color clothing. Um, and We'll talk a little bit more about this, of where you, you can, you can, um, how you can behave in the woods that will cut the thing down. Um, the type of clothing has an interesting effect. Um, things that have wool and corduroy and whatnot that have some physical nap to the fabric attack the, the ticks have a much easier time attaching to it. Whereas nice brushed cotton, when we go out and sample for ticks, we drag an old wool blanket by, it's an old army blanket. Uh, although we prefer a white one instead of a, a green one because it's easier to see the ticks on it. Um, and you know, if you get something, you know, for people that like to go trout fishing, you know, a lot of the waders that are, you know, that neoprene rubber, there's enough for the tick to grab onto. So you see a different relationship there. What you can use for sprays? Now, here's where the confusion comes. Most of us, when the mosquitoes come out, you get the deep base products and you put it on. And DEET is allowed to put on your skin. You can put it anywhere. Um, but DEET is a repellent. It doesn't kill. Them. It just they don't want to go where it is. So unless you cover every square inch of your body, technically a tick can run around and find a spot that you didn't treat and it can start to feed. Now, in studies, it's 98% effective. So, you know, yes it is. The problem is the permethrin sprays are, first of all, not labeled for your skin, although if your kids ever get headlights, we'll put permethrin in the shampoo on it. But the product that we're using for ticks is only for your clothing. It's sold as a repellent. But it is not. It kills the ticks. If they come into contact, it will kill them. We call that a kerosene, made to kill ticks. And this stuff is 100% effective. And the interesting thing is if you've got a pair of work coveralls and you spray it down, that stuff will stay there until you wash it. So it, it's not like you've got to keep it up. You know, the problem with deep, some of the deep products you have to apply three, after three hours because it starts to break down, or other repellents, you know, some of the eucalyptus oils and other things that we have. This stuff stays there and is highly toxic um, to them. So, as I said, studies have shown it to be 100% effective. And so you, you spray it on your clothing. As I said, there's even clothing that it's impregnated. The Army came up with this technology. In fact, they did some of this, this research up at Fort McCoy, you know, because Fort McCoy is, is one of the hot spots. You had people come from all over the country to do their you know, summer training, and then they go back into areas that the doctors know nothing about Lyme disease. I mean, that was a nightmare. Uh, for the longest time. So the Army's got ways of impregnating permethrin into the clothing. You can buy this at sporting goods stores. I know Ex Officio's got a, a bug off brand. Now one of the things that drives me crazy, technically you can only do what the label of the product tells you. You can go and buy permethrin to spray your vegetables. You can go and buy it for spraying termites. So what people will do to save a couple cents is go buy the termite stuff and then they'll put it on their clothing. It's illegal and it's stupid. Because the termite stuff, although it's got the same active ingredient, the concentrations are quite a bit different, plus the carriers. I will guarantee you the chemicals they use to put something in for termites are much different than I wouldn't want on my person. Forget even the chemical, the carriers I wouldn't want on my person. And so I was foolish enough to make my opinion known one time on one of these internet boards, you know, there's a bunch of hunters and they're talking about it. I went down to, you know, Fleet Farm and bought this stuff and it's, you know, I can do it for two cents to treat my pants. And you try to explain to them, forget about it being illegal, it's just not a wise decision. 
uh, when you can buy the stuff for three dollars to spray your, your paint. So, um, not so much at the drugstores. To be honest, the stuff you usually got to go to a sporting goods store or whatnot. Um, it seems to be Walmart carries it. Good. Yeah, I mean it's good. I locally in Madison we pick it up at REI. Is that like a five percent concentration for me? Um, most of that stuff I think is probably a half a percent or one percent. It's really pretty mild. Well, okay. It, it, it's really an interesting chemical. It, it, honestly, it's a synthetic version of a natural occurring pyrethrum. And pyrethrum comes from chrysanthemums. The problem with pyrethrum, it degrades in sunlight. And you want something that's got residual here. So the permethrin is a synthetic version of that. Really relatively non-toxic to people, but it's nasty on fish, and it's nasty, not quite as bad, on cats. They don't want to spray your cats. Some cats have a, a sensitivity to it. So. Where would you find that out? You read the label. The label's very explicit. Yeah. Okay, now in Connecticut in particular, or New England, there's been a lot of work done in because the ticks seem to be in people's yards, but as I said, it's not the average yard to me. Um, and in this question comes up: if you own property, what can I do? You know, aside from your own personal protection. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you some things you can consider, but I don't think they're all that practical in most cases. But we do know that the drier you make the area, the more you open up and get rid of the understory, the more hostile it is for ticks. So clearing areas, in particular at ground level, is important. Mowing trails, aside from the trail itself, it allows you to walk through the woods and you're not brushing against vegetation that's holding the ticks. So that's going to help. And spray is a possibility. So now, this trail doesn't excite me as much, although it's still less probability probably want to be a little bit wider in there's still enough vegetation here that I can see where the ticks would somewhat have a chance of surviving but they're much, they're much more like this now you don't have to put wood chips down but the property I spend a lot of time over by Avoca you know the, the trails that they've got and most of these because they burn some of those areas and whatnot um, seem to be between the compaction and keeping the mold and whatnot you know the grass is like this I don't worry about ticks in that area I really don't. so um, allows you to go out and enjoy the woods um, and have far less likelihood of running into ticks. On the other hand, if you do an excursion through here, you got to expect to pick the ticks up because, as I said, those are the kind of habitats that they want. But a study is just by removing the leaf litter. Now, what they're going out there is with rakes, 92% reduction in the tick numbers because it becomes a desert to the ticks. So that's why, I, you know, if, if you've got a cabin, the area that you mow around is going to be perfectly safe. It's when the kids get off of that and go into the woods is when the risk comes. They will even put barriers. I'm going to show you some barriers in a second. Um, in other areas, the, the, the issue with firewood and stone walls in it is because that's where the mice hide out. And if you've got mice concentrated in an area, that's fueling the tick numbers. So in New England, they literally go to the point of putting gravel or wood chip barriers two and three feet wide between the woods and where the kids play. And they find that that offers them a moderate amount of protection. Now, you really don't need to get fancy and put the rocks in. You just, again, have got to clear it so that it's dry and the ticks aren't going to want to, going to hang out in that kind of area. Now, it turns out there's a whole bunch of sprays that you spray ticks. Now, the interesting thing, because their life cycle takes two years, if you spray once a year, you get full bang for the buck. There's no reason to spray multiple times because it's not like, you know, if, if I was talking something like uh, um, aphids, you spray once and three weeks later you got eight million aphids again because they breed so quickly, not ticks. So there's a lot of common garden insecticides and there are formulations of permethrin that you can spray. But in order to be effective, you have to have the amount of pressure that I equate with a big, big uh, leaf below. You've got to disturb the stuff and drive it down and shake it up because if you don't, the spray's up here and the ticks are hiding down between the leaf litter here and it isn't very effective. They've even found, there's a product out there called insecticidal soap. It is a soap that kills insects. If you can use insecticidal soap, you can kill ticks. But it's all about the pressure. It's all about driving it. And this is, so even if you got, the neighbor's got a you know, farm sprayer, he isn't going to put the volume or the pressure on to do it for you. Um, now, there is some benefit in these cases where people have been that, you know, if I had a hand sprayer, 
and I sprayed from ground level up three feet as best I could, that's better than nothing. You know, but I'm only treating a small area. And if you got 40 acres, I say, here's where the problem is. You got 40 acres, are you going to go through and spray the whole 40 acres? Probably not. Wouldn't be that expensive. You just you get the equipment in, I mean, all those kinds of problems. <clears throat> Some other technologies are really quite interesting. This one is a bunch of cotton balls that they treat with permethrin. And they put it out there, and the mice take the cotton balls and put it in their nests. And any ticks that try to breed. Now, what was disappointing about this technology is the cost of that technology is very small as far as producing it. You need some cotton, you need some cheap insecticide. You try to buy this stuff, it's pricey. It really is pricey. It takes a little bit of time to kick into. It doesn't work overnight, but in a matter of a couple months, it does reduce the tick numbers. So here we got the mouse taking these treated balls back in. And um, so this, this um, it has some merit in certain circumstances. Another system that came out was kind of the same concept, but they did it different. You ever use front line on your dog? You know, it's a, it's a, a tick treatment that you put on. What they were doing with this bait box is they would put a bunch of mouse bait in, they'd draw the mouse in, and he would get treated with frontline as he came through. <laughs> and the thing about frontline, it lasts for weeks on the dog. So you send the mouse out. So again, a very interesting technology, and to be honest, not that expensive, but when Bear came out with this as a labeled product for treating a quarter acre, it would run you 500 bucks. So it didn't catch on. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> What's intriguing about both those technologies is you think about we're not using very much insecticide to get the same effect as we would if we were spraying big areas. So that really was appealing about it, is we were concentrating it where it was going to do the most good, as I said, on those have Now, in New England, they've also talked about treating the deer. They have feeders. They use big paint rollers treated with, when we allow the deer to self-treat when he comes in to feed, and then he goes out there, and then the ticks get on there. And this is effective too, but it's expensive. This, of all of them, is the most expensive of the three to do it in a practical manner. So, kind of a summary of what's going on. Ticks by themselves are disgusting animals, but if they weren't transmitting diseases, it wouldn't probably be worth our time sitting here talking about it. But what we, we have, unfortunately, is an animal that's capable of taking diseases from other animals and transferring it to humans. And most of us don't have immunity to these things because they're relatively new uh, exposure to us. And as I said, do not be surprised. In fact, this a month ago there was a report about a new virus never been described before showed up in Oklahoma, killed a person, and it's tick-borne. I will not be surprised at all that they trace it back to a road of some sort in this tick. And it's a Lone Star tick, I'm sure, because that's the one that hangs out in that state. And so I, I expect this, as I said, every Three to four years, we're going to discover some new diseases, unfortunately, that fit into this. So it's, it's going to be kind of a stay tuned story. <clears throat> Babesiosis, um, I didn't mention this one. It's a malaria-like disease that the ticks spread. Um, it is, we've seen a handful of cases in Wisconsin. Apparently, most of us are, that are healthy, if you're exposed to this, don't get sick. But if you have a compromised immune system, other things going on, then it can become a disease of, of, of concern. Uh, and same story, it's the deer tick, it's picking it up from rodents. Um, because it is more malaria-like, there's other treatments that they have to use. Um, 45 cases in 2011. Um, again, most of them seem to be the northern part of the state. Um, and there seems to be a concentration up in that Spooner area. Spooner gets picked up all the time here. <coughs> Palacian virus is a, another new one. Um, this one is not rodent born. We don't know a lot about it, um, other than this one, it turns out that there's um, a possibility that the ticks can spread it to their young, but in very, very low numbers. So that's why we're not getting many people sick about it. But because it's a, a virus, you know, there's a lot of good treatments for it, but it causes brain inflammation and the like. We had two cases in Wisconsin in 2012, so um, we expect this may be going up. We're kind of watching it. Not quite sure all the, all the, the dynamics of this disease, um, but as I said, 
as I keep watching this story, it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing new things come up. So, if you get a tick on you, save the tick. Put it in alcohol, rubbing alcohol. I've had people send it to me in gin, vodka, you know, clear <laughs> alcohol, because they won't degrade in that. It's important to me, and, and I'm finding in a lot of medical facilities, they're getting good enough to be able to identify the ticks. If you bring a tick in, it's a wood tick, there's far less concern. If it's a deer tick, then indeed that opens up the potential. As I said, the other side of it, and I'm not sure, but if you ever have a tick and you want to have it identified, so since I retired, uh, thank goodness, they, they hired somebody for my position. This gentleman's name is P.J. Leash, and P.J. would be more than happy to look at the tick for you um, and identify the deer tick. Now, we cannot test if it has Lyme disease. Um, there are laboratories that will do this. Um, Gunderson was doing it. I'm not sure if they are still doing it. Where this was the biggest concern is back when this was all first unfolding, when especially women who were expecting, were pregnant, wondering if the tick had Lyme disease or not because the question of antibiotics and exposure to the fetus was a big question. But it still goes back to even if the tick was carrying, if it wasn't idle long enough, I mean, it doesn't tell us everything we need to know. But if for people really demand it, you can send ticks off. And, you know, I, unfortunately, I, I think it would probably cost you $100 plus to get a tick tested just to see. And to me, again, more important story, was it the right kind of tick? Was it there long enough? Those are the two big questions that you have to answer. Okay. <clears throat> so, tick season already. And, and, and the vets have been telling me that they've been seeing ticks coming for a couple weeks. And you had mentioned, yeah. so you think your, 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 your dog acquired it this spring, or do you think maybe? I think it was in the fall. Okay, in the fall. Okay. Yeah, Spend a lot of time outdoors. You know, when I go out with my friends and we're burning prairies and whatnot, I got a pair of coveralls. You know, and they're sprayed, and so I just put my coveralls on, and I'm set. And I have really got a lot to worry about. And as I said, in areas where you know the deer ticks, then I pay attention to where they, they're long enough, start to swell. And if that's the case, then we go for it. So I call my, my doctor up. He's used to putting up with me. I give him the information. He gives me a one day antibiotic. So technically, I've been treated three times for Lyme. But I've never had the disease progress to the point where I was got off of sick. So. so now, this year, as I said, I have seen a relationship when we have a significant drought that we knock the socks out the population and honestly, when we had that 88, 89 drought, it took the ticks probably about five to six years to start coming back. And we started to see it moving in new areas. That's what we were measuring, is it just stopped moving. And it's because they were so, but that's not, not uh, uh, <clears throat> very common. You know, those are drought of the century type of things. I was not surprised the winter didn't have an effect because I don't care how cold it is for air temperature, those ticks are sitting down underneath the snow cover <laughs> down the litter. So they're far more blanket and insulated from all those crazy conditions. As I mentioned, there is a relationship of deer densities, but just because you have deer doesn't mean you have the ticks. We've been watching this in Milwaukee and some of the northern suburbs, you know, brown deer and whatnot. They've got people that have beautiful homes out in the wooded areas. They've got deer running everywhere, and we can't find the ticks. They're just not there, you know. But the other side of it is interesting. If you've got no deer at all, we don't see the ticks being very happy. So there will be ticks out there every year, as I said. I, I've really kind of given up making predictions um, because although in one area you might see it, and I bet you you could correlate if you were watching this close enough with the rodent populations, because that's what we know is fueling this whole thing. But it's always the year after the big rodent populations and the ticks have the big bump up. And they'll go back and down. So, more than you wanted to know? <laughs> It really is quite, I mean, it's an intriguing story. As I said, it will, it will continue to unfold. And the biggest risk is for people who like to spend time outdoors. You know, so three weeks, 40 weeks from now, people aren't going mushroom hunting. Boy, they're getting around in a lot of areas where you can get exposure. You think about it. Turkey hunters, you know, that turkey, turkey hunters are exposed to the, the remaining adult ticks from last year. Um, and then you get into the summer. You know, I talked to a lot of people who like to go trout fishing. You know, they're crawling around all kinds of places. High incidence of people who go trout fishing getting exposure to anaplasmosis and, and Lyme and auriculosis, it seems. Um, and then the fall of the year is when I, I worry about people dropping their guard, just depending how the fall progresses. 
but I can't tell you the first of November because it could be the 15th of December. As I said, I, I need snow, and then I'm, you know, because you get two weeks of cold weather, and then you get that 50 degree day. You know, guys are out deer hunting and they're crawling around in the areas that they like to get exposed. Now, what I don't get nervous about is when you bring the deer home and hang it up in the garage. You will find ticks falling off. But those ticks, unlike mosquitoes, ticks don't get off one animal and then crawl on you to feed. I mean, they've been feeding, they're done. That's even if they're only partially fed. So there isn't as much risk there. And the interesting thing, thank goodness, is none of these ticks I told you can breed in your house. There is one tick that could. It's called a brown dog tick. It will not bite by people, but you, you pick it up on dogs. The only time I ever see that tick in the state is when people have been traveling, especially to the southwest, where they've kenneled their dogs, and the dogs picked up from another dog. And so you get all these little ticks in the, in the dog bedding and whatnot, um, relatively easily treated. And as I said, the nice thing about it is it's really pretty much a non-factor for people. Um, so I don't worry about any of these ticks breeding. Yes. Could you have ticks uh, where you have mouse, like a wood pile up by a house, but you have no trees around your house, and it's all corn fields or bean fields? Can you get ticks there? Because you have wood piles. Yes. There's I no mean, woods. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you, you could get some ticks, but life would be pretty tough on them. You know, so it, one of the ways we sample, really want to sample ticks, other than dragging my, my thing, is we do mouse traps. And then we count all the little ticks on the mouse ears, and we can see who's active what's going on. Um, and so I could see that, that, that there would be ticks associated with that. But then when the tick gets off and has to wait for something else to come by, it's just a terrible environment for them to sit in. You know, and they're not going to go through all three feedings on the mouse. That they just have, as I said, there's this interest as they get older and mature, they prefer large mammals. And, and so they're looking for yeah, dogs and stuff. And, okay. Thank you. Yes. With the reframe on your slideshow, 10 to 60 days, there's also a reference to um, washing. So if you spread and then you wash the clothes, is that reframe washed off yeah, at that you, point? you can pretty well figure that. The other thing that makes me a little nervous, if it's really dew-filled and whatnot, you're getting a lot, it's probably less likely. Now, it depends on the formulation. Um, there are some formulations out there now you can buy, very concentrated permethrin, where you take your clothes, you soak them in there in, you know, for a number of hours, then take them and you got to hang them for three days and whatnot. I would guess that that formulation would last better, but the standard, you know, aerosol spray that we've got, as I said, um, I think washing would pretty much break it down. As would probably the temperature of a dryer and stuff. I mean, those all are pretty good at degrading chemicals. Um, I did some research on this. There's this thing called Insect Shield. It's a trademark, and it's a, a, a solution you can send it to this company and they'll impregnate your clothes. So if you have like coveralls or you mm -hmm. have a jacket, and they'll infuse it into it. It's like $15 for a pair of coveralls or whatever. And it's supposed to last for 75 washings. Okay. Well, as I said, I, you can buy that same stuff already done. That's, yeah. that's the bug off stuff that, yeah. that ex officio and I've seen other stuff. So I, I know I've both got a hat with it, which is kind of good for deer flies, among other things, and, and, and like. And, um, and I've got a shirt that I use, just a, a t-shirt when I'm out. I like to shoot arrows, and so most archery clubs can only afford to have land in swamps. Yeah. So you have tournaments in the swamps <laughs> in the summer. Not fun, but these things do help quite a bit. Although, my ultimate for, for when mosquitoes get that bad, I have a net suit. You know, just a sure. billowy net suit that you can put on it, a little hood on it. That works as good as anything. And honestly, the, the, the mesh on that, the reason I got the mesh suit is somebody sent it to me to evaluate it for tick control, or not for tick protection. In this particular one, the mesh is so small that even the smallest stage of ticks can't get through. So, you know, it, to some degree, but, you know, they can, crawl, they can get through it, they can crawl on it. And one of the things you might have witnessed if you're <coughs> camping or if you're walking, the ticks didn't get on your purse and you put your clothes off in the corner and whatnot, you come back a day or two, and they're sitting there waiting for it. They were on your clothes, on your socks, they didn't get a chance to attach. And then when you threw them there, they're just sitting waiting, and although they can't breathe, could they live for five, six days waiting for somebody to come by? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the same thing the poor family pet gets blamed a lot of times because they're out crawling around can bring ticks back. There's an interesting relationship. You know, cats don't seem to get near as much Lyme disease. Um, in part of it's probably not susceptible, but one of the other questions comes in is cats preen themselves so well, they're probably removing the ticks, whereas a dog is, you know, hygiene-wise, I don't think it's as likely to pull it off, so you see dogs tend to pick it up more often than cats. So. Yeah. 
So there's lots of interesting relationships. And the one thing I've always been intrigued with from the scientific standpoint is how the raccoons and I mean, all the other wildlife fit into this puzzle. But we don't have all the pieces. But I think we've got the important ones. It's in rodents in particular. And as I said, now we're pointing our finger at chipmunks because we found out that they, they have more to do than we thought. Yes? Um, I read a while ago that it's possible that some other insects are also transmitting some of these in tick vector diseases now. Is that true? You know, I, generally not. Interesting enough, I mean, the interesting question that came out is why can't a wood tick transmit? It's feeding out the mice and whatnot. Well, I was hearing mosquitoes. And yeah, see, see where the problem is. Now, a couple of the viruses, the Pelosian virus I showed you, that can be mosquito borne. Lyme disease, definitely not. Like I said, there's a very unique relationship between that tick and that spirochete uh, that, that fit into it. And, um, you know, one of the problems when you're running those tests, so if I get a deer fly that lands on me and I squash it and I test it, it can have the blood of an animal that was infected. So it would turn as a positive deer fly. But what you have to prove in the laboratory is that deer fly can take that and when it bites something else, it can transmit it. And that's what we've never seen. Like people have looked at that. And as I said, so even these reports, and I, people have asked me that on the radio, they read a report that now we know that wood ticks could. But we've been dealing with this now for, you know, 25 years, if wood ticks could transmit in Wisconsin, we would, we would have evidence of it, you know, and, and we just don't. So, um, good news there. Yes? I've often wondered um, if any research has been done. So Kenny and I can go out in the woods together, cut wood, whatever, hiking, whatever. He'll come back with 5, 10, 20 ticks on him, I will have none. Is there, a, have they ever done any research on They've done it with mosquitoes, and you know, mosquitoes, we know there's all kinds of body chemistries involved with ticks, yeah. I, I, I think it's yeah. just the way they work. So again, I would wonder, either clothing differences that would pick it up, or he's more inclined to crawl in places that you want, would want to crawl in. Oh, no, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the fabrics in particular. Yeah. As I said, just pay attention to that and see if there's some difference there that you might have something that's a little no, easier for them really. to latch on to. Jeans, t-shirt, boots. Okay. Yeah. That's why we've always often wondered. What do you, the, the reason the carbon dioxide should be an issue is I can't believe that you, your levels of carbon dioxide you're giving yeah. off is, is, is going to be that much different. different. Now, you know, it has been found, you know, if, if you're, as I said, ticks aren't real good at moving, but if you're a stationary target, you know, you spend two hours sitting and having a picnic and whatnot, yeah. could a tick crawl from 10 feet away to get you? Yes. I mean, because they're, the closer they get to you, the more carbon dioxide, so they know they're, they're going someplace that they might get a meal. Mm. So there, there is that relationship, but um, in general, they're pretty slow moving animals. Thank God they couldn't fly, because yeah. that would be quite a <laughs> <quite, quite laughs> uh, Yes? Suggestions about footwear and is spraying effective with footwear or what? what yeah, do? I mean, I, normally I you've got hiking boots and whatnot. Um, you know, most people concentrate more on their socks and their pant legs. In fact, it's the other thing. You know, when I spray, I typically don't worry anything about above here. And, and the problem, you know, people have this kind of urban legend that ticks drop from trees. Um, it's not a good thing for a tick to go up in a tree because the chance of something coming by is pretty small. I think the problem is if a tick gets on my person, where's the first place I'm gonna, it's gonna find a place to, to latch on is my neck. So you get this impression that they're starting high, they're really starting low and climbing up. And that's why if you treat that, they've walked on that treated pant leg and they're not gonna make it. And that permethrin is that much of a contact uh, insecticide. Yes? Comment and a question. Um, a comment to the audience for us. I've had Lyme disease or ehlichiosis. Five times. Lots of times, chronic. Um, doing well now. Um, and I like to know why. Check things out. I carry a magnifying glass in my pocket. With what you armed us with here the visuals, um, all the talk. I believe it's possible for a person to very easily educate themselves enough to self-diagnose, in a sense, um, showing that um, larval stage of the ticks. I've had larva on me. Every tick I get, I look at with a magnifying glass. If you familiarize yourself, and it only takes a few times, 
you can tell when their body, like Phil was saying, their body swelling as opposed to being flat and dried out looking. And it becomes an intriguing thing. Like say, I, me, I'm curious, I always want to know what's going on. And so when I found ticks on me that are attached, I feel pretty confident in by looking at them, but it takes a magnifying glass in knowing, yep, he hasn't fed yet. Yeah, this one's been on me long enough. He's starting to swell up. It is noticeable. So in this area where it's, I'm it's sure so you know. So prevalent. Yeah, so prevalent. Um, educating yourself and arming yourself. With With a few, uh, the other big thing is a daily tick check when it's tick season. I've got hundreds of moles and freckles on my body, but the brain can compute this. If you look at your body every day, it doesn't take too long and the eye picks up, wait, that's not right. And you can pick up this small thing as a larva. The question that uh, the question that I have then is um, this one that's been not clear in my mind. Um, I remember a couple few years ago, uh, the thing with the rodents and, and in this particular article, it said something like, mice, shrews, chipmunks being a vector. In my mind, I surmised, oh, that means, yes, the larva attached to them, spread them around, so they're spreading them around areas. And in another more in-depth article, I was reading about it, and what they were saying was that the rodents are actually have the disease and that that bacteria is part of their gut flora and the ticks like you said you you suggested this too is that that's where the ticks pick up the disease so you know is that actually part of their gut flora well or, or it, is it a disease that that particular rodent has no it's a disease so the technical term is the rodent is the reservoir okay so that that's that's where the bacteria is living and abiding in, and then the tick being a blood feeder is picking it up. But the interesting thing in the comment about mosquito feeds on the chipmunk, but it's a much more complicated thing that once it gets into the tick, it starts in its gut tract, and then it's got to migrate up to the salivary glands, which takes some time. And then the salivary glands don't get activated until they start feeding, and then they inject it. So as I said, there's, there's this interesting relationship that seems to be unique Whereas with the wood tick, some, something's broken there. It doesn't doesn't go through that cycle. So it's this is a biological cycle versus something we would call mechanical. Whereas if I punched the uh, the infected chipmunk with a knife and got some of its blood and then if it hit you, if it was mechanical, you could pick it up that way. There's, there seems okay. no no evidence of that. The other reason it doesn't work that way is there's not enough spirochetes running around in the blood. So it's really low levels of infection in the mice, and we don't seem the mice don't seem to mind it, and they don't seem to have much problem. Um, there's some question with with coyotes, you know, because related to dogs, and dogs have some sensitivity, but you know, it's a little hard to, to read it. You can you can see the antibodies, but if they start getting arthritis and whatnot, they're probably getting eaten by other coyotes, and you know, so understanding some of these what's going on, but those are kind of dead ends, you know, when we're talking like a bigger picture yeah. of, of how this disease is getting getting moved around. And, Yes. Um, when you, if you're out somewhere and you would get uh, either a nymph or an adult on you, say on your clothes that you didn't see, and you came inside and you took off those clothes and hung them up, put them on the next day, how long could a tick or a, uh, that was adult yep. or yep. a nymph live if it was just like hanging out on your clothes? Depends on temperature and humidity, but I'm thinking a number of days. So one of the thoughts, if, if you've got a concern about clothing, throw it in the dryer. Not even wash it. Forget about the washer, but the temperatures you generate in the dryer would easily kill it. Well, that's what I've been doing, and I'm wondering, is that really, you know, does that make sense to do that? Because oh, I think so. Because I find ticks a day or two later on something I wore, a jacket or something, yeah. and I'm going, did I just get that, or has it been there? Yeah, and, and it's hard to say, because again, you bring in some firewood, you could carry your right. I mean, There's yeah. other ways you can transport them in, but as I said, the dryer, if you got some work clothes and that they're really particularly bad, I think that's just an easy way. 
be honest, that we're doing the same thing with bed bugs. It's just fascinating. It's so you can take your hair dryer and heat your head up too, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, look. How do you find these little things so, in your hair? You what, what I'm guessing is the critical temperature is going to be about 112 degrees. You know, the question is, can you get it in But, um, yeah. So, in the room, what, medium hot for 20 minutes is more than that. Uh -huh. If there's some physical things. Mm. Yes. So, how do they respond, like, if you bathe or shower? Do they, does the water kill them? No. Okay. Even okay. Hot water. Their oxygen demands are so low you can't drown them. So even if you take a bath for an hour, that's not, you know, if one's on you, that's not going to go in. Unfortunately. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's assuming that uh, everything in nature has some value somewhere along the way. What value would ticks have? I mean, in other words, is there... <laughs> About as much as a mosquito? Yeah, you know, I, 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 that question, philosophical questions come up about mosquitoes. And from a human perspective, I'm sorry. There is not. I mean, the Lord probably has an idea what's going on there, but I don't. It doesn't. They're just a detriment, I, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I. Um, I've always thought that myself, but I kept thinking, well, it's only because I don't know really. No, be because, you know, so I, the mosquito one is used more often when they feed the birds. Well, yeah. I've got enough other gnats and other yeah. little flies, and they say, <laughs> without mosquitoes, the birds still got something to eat. And the same with the ticks. Now, interesting enough, you know, chickens are very efficient at foraging for and guinea hens. Okay. You know, so people talk about it, but aside from being noisy and the coyotes eating mine, you know, I said, let them go. They, the way they forage, they would, would reduce tick numbers. That, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm. So that's true about the guinea hens. We guinea fowl are supposed to be particularly oh. huh. good at that. Yep. Okay. And they also will take mice and rodents. So uh, you've taken care of that part of it too. Yes. Uh, we moved here in Wisconsin about 35 years ago. I've made wood every year. And I think I could count on two hands the ticks that I've had all those years. Wow. Yep. Nice. A friend of mine and the family came out. We went walking through the woods. The lady had three ticks on her within a half hour. <laughs> Is there a, of course, if I'm out with a chainsaw, am I, maybe I'm making enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't see of anything. I would think that the activity and the vibration would get them excited. Yeah. They said because they have the exhaust with the. Yeah, and all those years, that's all the ticks I've ever had. And, well, you know, as I said, when I think about micro environments, the property that I'm over by Avoca, I mean, I really have to work. The dogs pick them up on occasion, but not much. But I was telling Jackie, I, you know, I can go into Governor Dodge Park. If I want to pick up deer ticks, you get off trail, in Governor Dodge, it's just, it's crazy. And, and there isn't that much difference. But I think if I would look at what the understory, you know, what plants are, and, you know, they've done these studies, you know, in soil type in some, you know, sands are pretty dry and hostile, that's not good for them. Um, as I said, I pick on raspberries and stuff just because that seems to be, and I think what it's maintaining is enough humidity and enough cover to keep the ticks happy. Um, but their correlations were with river valleys and, and there's, there's some geographical features. But if you think about deer corridors, deer are running up and down the river, edge of the river. And so, like I said, it, it hasn't come as clean as you would think. But it's almost gotten to the point now, I can feel, I can, I, just the feel of the woods, I can say, yeah, this is going to be full of ticks, or no, i got nothing to worry about here. And, but it's, it, I'm reacting to what's going on, you know, how much open ground, that kind of stuff. Okay, a year ago, two years, a year ago, last October, I took a little tick off my arm. And uh, I didn't think anything about it. You know, you, you have ticks and you take them off. About January, last part of January, began my knees began to ache and my ankles and got the place I couldn't put my heart to put my shoe on. I couldn't bend my ankle in that. Well, you can, I'm 86 and you're getting old, maybe it's arthritis. I never gave it a thought until this last January. And uh, so I had that for a year, or a full year before I, I went to the doctor, I said something wrong. And they did the test and it came out positive. But over a year's time, does that, uh, does, does it affect your body more or worse? Or? Well, they said the progression of the disease come, seems to come in stages. So the initial stage, you you should have, if you had a classic disease, had a fever and fatigue, but not everybody reacts that way. 
if the arthritis was related to it, that comes weeks, months after the initial tick bite. So it's, it's kind of, it's really the third stage. You know, and the problem again is all of us have body aches and, you know, they can come and go and, you know, it's, although they talk about more systemic types of things, big joints in particular, but in fairness to the medical people, I mean, this is a stinker for them to identify. And, you know, the question is, so you had spirochetes in you. I assume that they gave you antibiotics or something to, to work with it? Uh, February, this last February, they gave me the antibiotic shot. It seems to be, if you had to make a, a general rule, the earlier you get the antibiotics when you have the disease, the better the success rate. The longer it goes, um, I mean, if you really want to get in a controversial area, medically is, is talking about people who have experienced Lyme for years and then are treated, and how long does it take to make them better, or can you make them better? Um, and as I said, that's what I, the CDC has a, a pretty involved, it's called a white paper, and what they've done is look at all the clinical trials and the like. So, so one of the, the, the ways they treat people who've had this long-term stuff is with IV antibiotics for weeks on end. Some people have good results from it, some don't. Again, not being a doctor, but the interesting thing that I'm starting to come to the conclusion is maybe it's not Lyme disease. How many other of these organisms yes. can be around here? Yeah. I mean, I, I, this is a bigger can of soup than I think we think of it. As I said, it's not easy because I can't take a blood test other than testing for the antibodies and you know, tell what's going on. I, do I ever see the, the germ itself? No. And that's, that, I mean, that's the thing that would say, oh, put the life up on I see. Well, that's what they do with malaria. You know, they test your blood. They can see the parasites. But with Lyme disease, you don't. So you, uh, you mentioned raspberries. I have a raspberry plant, which is probably 25 feet away from the nearest wood line. My impression last year is I picked up some ticks from those raspberries. How, what's the likelihood? Or, I mean, it's not in the woods. Are there mice around? Yeah, some kind of sure. So, you know, if, if you're trying to sample for ticks, as I said, the, the, the fancy piece of equipment, you need an old flannel shirt or a pair of corduroys, and just whether you put it on a stick and, and, and go down in the ground level, or you drag it, and then just look to see what you pick up. You know, and that'll, to me, that tells me as, as quick as anything is, are they there at that particular spot? And then if it is, I, interesting enough, permethrin has got a label to put on raspberries to control raspberry pests, so you could spray for raspberry fruit worm and control the ticks at the same time. We have a 25, 30-acre grass hay field on a ridge, and that is endemically full of deer ticks. Of deer ticks. Yes, I can walk up there. My horses are up there, and they will be covered with ticks. Even if they walk up to it on a dug road that has very little That's or no vegetation. If you told me wood ticks, I'd say I've seen that. But it's been this way for years, and I think it's because the deer sleep up there. You can go up, and they'll just be popping out of the grass where mm -hmm. they've slept. Lots of deer beds, and I go up there at night or other times. The, the deer are just thick in there and they have a lot they spend a lot of time there but I always think of that if I'm going to be picking handfuls of ticks off my horses is because they've been up in that grass in that pasture. Interesting. I said I, I've seen that with wood ticks because it, it all kinds of fits it's more the habitat. Yeah, these I, are deer ticks. I haven't seen uh, You know ticks. interesting there, there's been a study done and again this is kind of some of the early work where you know a lot of the grasslands people will burn you know every two or three years and wondering how that did and you think well that burned those little devils out of there. Honestly, in a period of a year or two, it makes it worse. But the relationship is, okay, fine, you could kill every tick that's there. Maybe not, because they can often get deep enough. I mean, I've got a bunch of insects to survive the, the burn, because all the heat's going up here, and they're down here. But you get this lush regrowth, and lush regrowth brings in the rodents, and then that's what's, I think it's fueling in the story more than anything else. So that that's one, you know, it was a worthy thing to say, could burning reduce them in the areas, but it turns out it goes the other way on that, that, that's really quite interesting. Well, that's why I think it's happening, though, is because the deer are sleeping. Well, I can see them dropping off. But as I said, you wonder just yeah. for all the other things that they need, it's going to be over a long period of time. Why would they? It, does it seem seasonal at all for you? Well, in the winter, that's usually a place that has snow longer yeah. than other places. So I wouldn't, I don't really think of it in the winter. And the horses aren't up there in the winter. So I go up there a lot in late spring and summer. And so that's the really the time frame that I'm dealing with it with. So I really can't compare year round mm -hmm. with it. 
you know, and there are certain areas in our woods where I know I'm going to just pick up a boot full of ticks, and other areas where I don't, don't seem to pick them up. It seems like, you know, one hillside to another. You know, yeah, like but see, yeah, you know, the difference between south and north is they said moisture levels. I, I think that would play into it really yeah. very easily. Put. The, dry, the drier, the better. That's probably the one thing that you expect that might be something like that. Yeah, and, and walking around in other fields, I don't pick up ticks like that, but I do other than that. Yeah, as I said, I, I, I just, normally when I'm getting into prairie restorations and whatnot, I just don't seem to run into them. Mm -hmm. It's only when I get off in the woods and go crawling yeah, around. Yeah, I'm surprised when you said that, because that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I thank you for your attention. As I said, if you do get ticks, um, my counterpart, I mean, I'm, I'm still around, you can get me on the email and stuff, but um, if you want some help, um, both, both PJ, who's running the diagnostic uh -huh. lab, and our tick researcher um, is Dr. Susan Paskowitz, and she yeah. works both with, with mosquitoes and, and ticks and, and other arthropod-borne diseases. And as I said, so it's always good to kind of, she gets, she's got a good website with kind of up-to-date information, and her students are always uh, adding new stuff to it. As I said, her, the recent study of making them go out at 1 o'clock in the morning and sample for ticks. And, uh, of course, students are up at 1 o'clock, so oh. people are, but uh, um, it was just fascinating. Because what she has been tracking now with, with the years is we, we've been tracking certain state parks in certain areas and watching. And as I said, these little focal points, you can go back to the same spot that was, was terrible with ticks, and five years later, it's still terrible. I mean, these hot spots. You know, and as I said, trying to understand that dynamic is, is, is something I think would help us figure this out a little bit better. But. I have yet another question. Mm -hmm. you, you had said originally that ticks are not insects, they have these eight legs. Well, can you say just a little bit more about what classification they are? What are they? If, they're, if you don't count them. So the bigger, the bigger umbrella is arthropods. Yeah. Okay. And so arthropods break into groups, and there's spiders, you know, there's the ticks and mites, and there's the insects, and then there's, you know, other okay, crustaceans. Okay, separate. Uh, separate okay. groups. Okay. Yeah, all themselves. And, you know, the characteristic is they've really got one body region, I said no head, and those four sets of legs. Do they have a brain? Can you say they have any kind of a nervous system? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, do they have a central nervous Yes, but it's, it's more like it is in an insects. There are a number of segments. Like an insect, you can cut its head off and still live because it has other centralized nerve areas that can keep at least some function going. Same with the ticks. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a vessel that has various swellings. So it's not, there's no, not near as much going on in a central location as we normally associate with animals. But um, I mean, like I said, the one thing I do respect them as, a, as an animal is how you can go for two years and only feed three times. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you have to be so good at conserving your energy, you know, and, and utilizing it and, and stuff. So. Well, if our brains use so much of our energy, maybe that's why. Now. Yeah. yeah. Well, they don't as they said, in, in, in being cold blooded, they, they can just turn off, you know, so. When it's cold, they're not using much energy. When it's warm, the furnace is going. Yeah. When you uh, showed the map of the United States, we have a daughter in San Diego and has been there about eight years, and she said that's becoming a hot spot for a while. But the interesting thing about the California story, okay. a different tick, it's related. Wow. And it gets it from lizards. Mm. And so the, I told you our infectivity level is 40%, their infectivity level is 2%. Oh, so, it, you know, it, it's still an issue, yeah. but not near the same issue out there because of the different involvement of animals and ticks involved. They're getting it from lizards. Huh? They're picking it up from lizards. Wow. I just, uh -huh. in the last month, read two about some latest research in Northern California where birds are the suspect now. Oh, well, that could be because I'm not as familiar. The tick is Ixodes uh, um, pacificus, um, as I said. So it's a different tick. What's What's fascinating to me, and this is a, a, again a little bit of the unknown, that the genus Ixodes that the deer tick comes from in this one out in California has about 48 species in it in the United States, and most of them are very host specific. We've got a rabbit one, we got a raccoon one, and whatnot. And I'm just wondering, because there's, there's the woodchuck tick, it's called Exodes kukia, and every once in a great while, a person can get, I think, Lyme disease from that tick. Um, I don't think this is efficient, but that tick has been implicated with a couple other diseases. It's just not very common. 
you know, and, and the, the more, normally the only way to get one is to kill a woodchuck and find them on there. But in my career, I've seen a couple dozen come in that people have found on themselves and we just kind of watched it. And so they said, when they send me a wood tick, I say, nothing to worry. If they send me something that closely related, I'd say, I'd be careful. Uh, well, you know, I, I get nervous about that one. Say, uh, a year, maybe it's two years ago, National Geographic did a big feature article on, I believe they dubbed him the Ice Man, the mummified body, 54, 53, 5400 year old body that they found on the Austrian Italy, 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 Italy. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, this the reason they did this feature article because they had taken some hundred and some samples off of him and his clothing and artifacts that they found with him. And so the article discussed all these things. And one paragraph was headed with curious things they found. And they found the Lyme bacteria in the ice man, 5,400 year old body. Surprise you? No, only because, as I said, there is a, there is a Lyme disease in Europe, and it's it's very closely related, but it isn't quite the same. And it's been going on. So the, the tick there is the sheep tick, Zodiac Vicinus. And so, no. The interesting thing is more the recent thing. As I said, we can trace ours back to the last 60, 70 years of how do they show up? Where did the tick come from in the northern part? And then where did the spirochete come from? Why wasn't it going on in Texas? I mean, the tick's been there all the time. It never got froze up by the Ice Age. They don't have any Lyme disease to speak of down there. So, so they said there's some parts of the puzzle that just haven't quite been figured out yet. Yeah. And, uh, and then on top of it, those bacteria causing these diseases, I've been studying it because I've been related to so many things over the years. Uh, that bacterium is, they label it as a super bacteria. It's very hard to duplicate in a lab. The understanding of it, it's just you yeah, know, the, research. The coat keeps changing on the outside, which makes the diagnosis. They're a shape shifter. You know, they can be in your bloodstream. They can encase themselves in a cyst. They can go intracellular. And now you have to have antibiotics that focus on each one of those when you have a chronic. It's just well, I, I heard a very interesting show on People's Pharmacy, and that's on public radio. Yeah. And they were talking to. Um, these were veterinary researchers in North Carolina, and we were talking about cat scratch fever, which is another bacterium that has some interesting aspects. And then they got the same thing about Lyme disease. They said that there's, there's and basically what they're saying is, we know the easy ones now, you know, that the scientists have figured out, and now these other ones that are really very complicated. They said we're we're having a hard time getting our arms around really understanding all what's going on here. I think. It's, 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 on one level, it's really fascinating and intriguing where they're trying to go with this, you know, and as technology improves and stuff. But uh, yeah, from a disease standpoint, you know, on a human disease, it's pretty scary stuff. Yeah. Well, that technology is what they proved, they can prove now that our population of deer ticks here came from Texas. Ah. But it came just once. Ah. You know, because there's not as much genetic diversity in the Wisconsin populations as there are down in Texas. Oh, wow. Game farms. Yeah, all that. I, I mean, we're still within that potential era. Yeah, I know. It's, it's uh, yeah. Well, but, uh, thank you for new information, yeah. for dispelling myths. Sure. <laughs> that yeah. us carry. Well, yeah. yeah. And for public radio. Don't ever quit that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I have fun. I, I, I always said so that's the most productive hour and a half I could spend. It's in a gas. And, it's, 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 and then Larry is just a poop. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's easy to do that job the first Okay, so. Well, I can tell that you love tips. I mean, you're very, very <laughs> enthusiastic. Yeah, but I'm, I'm kind of that way about insects in general. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. fascinating yeah. animals. I mean, they're just, yeah. just a tip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.